Well, good morning. Very good to see you all here today in the focus that you have put on renewable energy. The career that I've had is uh, somewhat different than most of you. In fact, some people were asking me last night, why did you ever get into this business of energy, renewable energy, and fuels? So I have to somewhat date myself. You know, I, I used to run around. Number one, I grew up in New Jersey, a little bit different than Iowa. And I used to drive around in a 57 Chevy, and I could run it for a, a dollar a week. And so that's sort of the calibration point of my life about machines and, and what it costs to, to run them. Now, I know that's a little bit out of date, um, but it always stuck in my mind that, number one, uh, I grew up in an era where people were always rebuilding machines. Um, we were not too concerned about fuel consumption back then. We were concerned about how much horsepower you could get under the hood. And so that kind of calibrated and shaped my thinking about this business. And I went to the military academy. Um, my career clearly shifted, and I focused on national security. And as a lieutenant, national security didn't mean too much other than surviving till tomorrow. But during that period, uh, I was an armor officer. And if you go back, and some of you may remember the movie Patton, and some of you who have served, understand that the one thing that was drilled into our mind is do not run out of fuel. It is a critical asset for military operations. Now, if you run out of fuel and you're flying something, that can be disastrous. Uh, if you're running out of fuel on the ground and you're in the middle of a fight, that can be pretty disastrous too. And so that was drilled into my head of the, of the national need uh, for a good policy and availability of fuel. Fuel on the battlefield, though, is a little bit different than driving down to the gas station that you're used to, whether it's providing a biodiesel and ethanol or gasoline or any other fuel. Uh, we had to figure out how to build our own stations around the world. In my early career, that meant bringing in things usually on a helicopter, flying in with a bladder, dropping it down on the ground, and then trying to refuel it. That was quite a challenge for us back then in the, in the time when I didn't have a pump to pump it. So we used to find a low spot on the ground and drive the vehicles down into the low spot and gravity feed. And that could take a long time. Uh, we eventually stole one vehicle literally one day and put a pony pump on it so that we could drop the bladder in the back of that and refuel. But those are the challenges that I have, have worked through in my career. In 1991, I was part of the operations at Desert Shield, Desert Storm. We did the left hook into the Euphrates River Valley that went through Iraq, not through Kuwait. So we had a long distance to go, and we had an area that we'd never been in before. We had literally um, maps that were for hundreds of kilometers blank, and we just drew lines on the map. But the biggest part of that problem in planning it uh, was twofold. The first was fuel. And we literally built a highway through the deserts for the 5,000-gallon tankers to come up behind us and keep refueling. And we practiced how we would do that at night and how we would do it continuously. And it was a touch-and-go operation. I will tell you, by the time we got to the Euphrates River Valley, people were literally refueling as we moved into combat operations. I think Dan saw that in, in his part of it, and I saw it in, in mine. And so again, fuel became a critical part. The other one was communications, what you're doing here today. Um, our radios at that point had about 35 kilometer range, um, maybe a little bit better. And we had 15,000 people on one radio working on a satellite comm. So the, the challenges of keeping things moving. The same thing happened here in 2003. You didn't see it. Uh, in Afghanistan, every drip of fuel that was put there was flown in. And so you may have seen some of the reports that fuel from a military context, uh, whether it's jet aviation or whether it's JP-8 diesel derivatives that we're using, are fuel that was flown at perhaps somewhere between $150 to $300 or $400 a gallon. Uh, people have widely estimated. But it was not $1 or $3 or 5 It was hundreds of dollars to get that fuel there because we had to build our own distribution system. In the first operations into Iraq, a pipeline was built that ran up into the first airfields inside of Iraq. And so we dropped the pipelines all the way through Kuwait up into the airfield. Uh, that then became the, the point for which the units then, for the next 
500 miles had to figure out how they were going to get their own fuel to themselves and refuel. If you're in a helicopter unit, that meant you have to set down fuel in bladders and people have to know where it is. You have to protect it. So fuel has become a critical part of military operations. If you watched our U.S. Navy, the operations of the fuelers and the conversion to a nuclear Navy were always critical parts of the fuel system. When I was in Vietnam, we had essentially three types of fuel that we used. We used gasoline, diesel, and jet aviation. Each of those then had to be distributed separately in a different fuel truck with different fuel handling and get it to the right place to the right time. I used to cringe when I was a young lieutenant and captain and I'd get tanks attached to my unit that burned gasoline. Gasoline in the tropics, one, evaporates pretty quickly, and two, very flammable, and three, they burned about four or five times as fast in terms of, of the distances we were traveling as the rest of the vehicles that I was operating. So when that had happened, I had to pay attention to two kinds of fuel. And if I had helicopters that came under refuel, then I had to apply attention to three. And so the conversion to JP-8 in the military was to go to a single fuel and the ability then for us to operate with half the logistics and half of the complexity that we have. And then JP-8 with additives can be converted to jet aviation fuel. So we were trying to simplify the methods that we were using to distribute fuel. But whether you're in the Navy on a nuclear ship that still had oilers to bring the fuel to the ships that were protecting you, whether you're in the Air Force flying on jet aviation, or whether you're in the Army with combinations of fuel, it's always been critical to military operations. But that's only part of the story, because we buy fuel the same as you do, wherever we can. In some cases, that means we have to be able to figure out where it is around the world. And so when people ask, why did you get invested in this, it's pretty natural, I think, for the military to look at at fuel as a particular requirement both for our sustainability of our forces and the ability to keep moving to the future. But one of the questions that we wrestle with right now as we looked at this was, so what does it mean in the 21st century? We, kind of, we knew what the history for the last 100 years told us, but we weren't quite sure what it meant for the 21st century. So we, we took a look at that, and our military advisory board has been working these issues for the last five or six years. You might also note that it's a CNA that used to stand for the Center for Naval Analysis. It's just CNA Corporation right now. But it was a, a research organization that supported the Navy. But you can see by the members that are up there on our board that they are not just Navy personnel on it, but all the services, Army, Navy, Marine Corps. And occasionally we brought in um, friends from the Coast Guard and other parts of the of the department to, to look at how we look at the problems of today. Most of the people there, when you sit down in a room, won't agree on anything. Now, I know that you all think that the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps is one team, and we all agree on everything that we're going to do. But you can imagine when you get that group together, we have a lot of discussions about our, from our perspectives. And that's why we do work together, because each of us sees the problem a little bit differently. We have different cultures that we deal with and we have different needs as we deal with it. But bringing these things together allowed us to voice those opinions and try to find some common themes to it. So as we go through these, uh, we're going to look at a lot of different things. The national security framework that we looked at has a number of different perspectives that we've looked at over the last seven years. The first one was climate change. Now, that really seemed like a strange one for a bunch of military folks to take on. But we saw that the, the sea level rise and the changes, the opening up of the Arctic, and where most of the trouble spots around the world could be tied directly to some issue that was probably associated with two things, water and changes in where that water became available, either by they had too much or too little. And so if you really look at the trouble spots on the world today, you can find those as issues. You may have noted a few years ago that the Russians planted a flag under the sea at the North Pole. Well, we haven't approved the law of the sea yet in this country. The Canadians are a little upset with us, but there's oil up there. We do at the North Slope, and everybody knows that that's another area that's been unexplored. And so that's been a challenge for us to figure out from a national security. So that climate change issue became one 
that brought us together to say, yeah, this is an issue that needs more attention. It's one of those things that you can't deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. That's weather. Um, and climate tends to creep up on you. And so the, the issue wasn't, we aren't going to argue about what was the cause, what we're going to do, but the issue was plan ahead. Think about what it might mean if these changes do take place and what are you going to do about it. We also said that was related to a lot of our energy and water problems. So the next thing that we looked at of powering America's defense was the risk that the availability of power and how it's distributed around our country and to our national assets was going to make to the military. And then we looked at it from next on powering America's economy. And you may remember Admiral Mullen as the chairman of the Joint Chiefs who just retired last year, spoke frequently that the security of the United States is as much dependent upon the economic security of the country as it is upon the Department of Defense. You can't afford our Department of Defense unless you have a strong economy. And so those two pieces come together. And then last we looked at earning Americans' freedom of movement. This was a little bit different because we focused just on transportation, and that's what I'll talk to you about here. But you have to note some differences. If you look at all of our energy requirements, our power plants, our electricity, is driven by coal and gas. Our transportation industry is driven by oil. Now, interestingly, when you look at the numbers, 70% of our transportation fuels are derived today from oil. So we're very dependent upon that for our transportation systems. If you look at that a little bit closer and look inside the Department of Defense, you see another set of numbers that emerge. Number one, the Department of Defense is the single biggest user of oil in the country. Single biggest user. But it's less than 2%. So that means it, it has a big role to play in it in one sense, but in the other it doesn't swing the needle left or right very much when you look at all of the fuel that's consumed inside the Department of Defense. The other thing that's different is that the fuel that's used by the Department of Defense, 70 percent of it in the transportation fuels goes to aviation. It's just the opposite of what happens in the commercial sector, where 70 percent of it goes into ground transportation, not into aviation. 30 percent goes back into the aviation. And so we have different uh, factors that drive the economics as we've looked at this. But in either case, it's important, and the Department of Defense does play a critical role. So we looked at the national security framework and the environment of economic strength, geopolitical stability, military capability, and environmental sustainability. In simple points, from an economic strength standpoint, without a strong economy, you're not going to have a strong defense. From geopolitical stability, we looked at the trouble spots around the world and how they're often tied to oil and climate change issues. We looked at military capability, as I've described in my own career, very much dependent upon the access to continuously fuel. And finally, environmental stability. Um, when we look at all these factors that are impacting today, and, and you'll get into all of the discussions as you look at fracking, the issues of water supplies, uh, the issues that we saw down of oil exploration in the Gulf when it goes awry, uh, all of those things play into the environmental stability that we're dealing with. So all of those factors are what we've determined is the framework for national security that must be addressed, not just one or the other, but all of them. So the bottom line to that is that national security is more than just the Department of Defense. It's all of those factors that need to be considered, and you're part of it when you look at the renewable fuels. A little bit about the facts that we looked at as we looked at just oil. Again, that was what was driving the transportation requirements inside the Department of Defense. We use about 20 million barrels a day. Half of that is imported. So we can generate, and we don't argue that you shouldn't drill for more oil, because we are continuing to provide that to our own economy. The other half, though, of that imported oil is imported from OPEC, the petroleum exporting companies. And those countries surrounding the Gulf region have not always been our best friends. So 25%, roughly, of our oil is coming from the Middle East. The other part that comes out of that is that our allies in Europe and in the Far East are much more dependent upon that oil than we are. But we're all collectively looking at it together as we go forward. 
The other point that we concluded clearly, though, is that oil has become a commodity, a global commodity. And its price is set by pretty much by OPEC. And the demand is driven around the world. So we in the United States can make incremental differences in it, but we do not control that as a strategic commodity. And you're going to hear more about that from other speakers as we go into it. But we can, we can put all the oil and drill for all we want in this country, but we are not going to be able to control the price of oil on the world stage. We just don't produce enough of it, and that's a factor that we cannot control. The other part is the demand side of it, and just one factor there, not looking at all the rest of the emerging countries around the world, but China is today is the second largest importer, and it's growing at 7% each year. So are we going to deny the Chinese access to that fuel? No. And that would be the reverse of what we've said is the right way to look at capitalism and, and how we should be allowed to get fuel wherever we need it. We do argue with them about some of their sources of fuel, uh, particularly in today's world and in Iran. Um, but in fact, there's not too much that you can't find around here that's not made in China. And so our business world has moved to China as the low-cost producer, just as we have for many, many years uh, tried to find where the lowest costs are. So for them to grow and to undermine their economy would undermine our own economy in today's world. And so this whole globalization issue is one that comes to the, the forefront. But the bottom line of that is somewhere in the next 10 to 15 years, they're going to exceed our imports for oil. And so, again, another factor as to why we in the United States cannot control that by ourselves. It is a world commodity and a strategic commodity around the world. The other factor that we all recognize is that it's finite. And the more people using it, increasing the demand against a relatively fixed supply. Now, nobody really knows how big that supply is, and a lot of scientific studies have, have looked at it, and you can argue about it. But the fact is that we all kind of know whether or not we get to the bottom of the barrel, literally, it's going to get more expensive each year as more people look at consuming it. And so while it's, it's not finite in the sense that we're going to run out in our lifetimes, not the bus sitting here in this room, but it is finite from the standpoint of what's cost effective. And so there's another factor then that plays into how we look at the facts surrounding oil. It's kind of interesting as you look at the world where we first started burning wood and then we moved to charcoal and then we moved to coal. And it's only the last hundred years that we've been burning oil. So we've made these changes historically as we've industrialized and built our capability around the world today. And so the question then is, what's next? What does the 21st century look like in terms of availability and access to the energy sources that we need? So the first thing we found is that our dependence, America's dependence on oil, is a significant national security threat. And it's to all of those four factors that we talked about, to the economy. We're relying on it and we're vulnerable to it as a world commodity. Our transportation system in particular is particularly dependent on access to oil. And the price volatility, as you've all watched over the last few years and heard some of the discussions earlier, swings what our investment community is willing to do. And so those economic factors play into our ability to maintain the quality of life and the national security in the United States that we would like. On geopolitics, because we are so dependent today on Middle East oil, not just for us but for our allies, it limits our ability and our options. And as we watch the growing demand that's coming out of China, and I could put India, and I could probably put, list a number of other emerging countries that, that will be appearing in the 21st century, that demand is going to go up. And so we are not going to be the only player that's going to be on that stage of that strategic importance. Military, um, and I've watched this over the years, and I have to tell you back in the 1970s, I was sitting on, a, on the ranges in Germany as we were protecting the borders there against the Soviets, and we would go to the tank ranges at Grafenvir, and we'd sit the tanks on the range at about 20 degrees in a miserably cold weather and shut them down because we didn't have enough money to pay for the fuel. Back then in the 70s, if you remember, it was the first fuel crisis that we really saw, and it directly impacted our ability to train. And if you can imagine getting into a, 
a 60-ton at that point piece of iron had been sitting out there in 20 to 30 degree weather all night long. It was just cold when you got in there. And by the way, it didn't perform as well until you got everything heated up to an operating temperature. So it impacted directly on our ability just because of that simple change in the 70s on the price of oil. And you've seen pictures in the paper, pictures on the news, day after day of our long logistics convoys that came providing fuel in Iraq and Afghanistan. They became targets for our enemies. And so we not only had to protect and do our job, but we had to, had to protect those long lines of transportation to bring those fuels in. And we lost lots of soldiers, and we lost lots of civilian contractors transporting that fuel. So it became a point of vulnerability. And then finally, uh, on the environmental side, people are looking at what is the impact of greenhouse gases and fossil fuel. Now, you may not agree on all of the facts behind it, but nobody likes to walk into a smoggy city and, and argue that it doesn't impact your health. Um, and so we've been doing things to fix that over the years, and we need to continue to do that. Well, we need to figure out where it's going to come from. What are the chances that we want to for our children and grandchildren so it's not limited? Again, your focus here on renewable fuels gives us options uh, that we haven't had to be able to both provide the fuel and reduce the greenhouse gases. So the answer is we have to go cold turkey? No, we don't. Uh, the easiest thing to do is change our lifestyle. And the second thing we found is that we could do that, that if we have a, just a 30% reduction in our demand for oil, that takes the Middle East out of play. Remember, they provide 25% of our fuel. But that allows our transportation systems to operate independently of any of the OPEC restrictions on fuel. And so we're not focused on the Straits of Hormuz, if you've been ready, reading about in the papers for the last uh, few weeks, as it's been threatened that it will be closed down. Our Navy isn't going to let that happen. But I also will tell you that over time, we need to figure out how to get away from that. And the number analytically that we came up with is 30%. So that's the first step. You don't have to go 100% immediately. But if we can get to that 30% figure, we significantly reduce our ability to operate our transportation systems. Efficiency is something I think that we all believe, and, and I would argue that in the Midwest you have a real focus on how to be productive, whether it's in your farmlands or whether it's in your homes, on how to do that. And that's not true everywhere. We know we waste a lot of energy. Thermostats are set too high when nobody's in a room. Uh, light bulbs are left burning when nobody's around. Cars are left idling. Uh, there's a lot of things that we look at these 100 mile per gallon smart car that are, that are smart things to do that in the past haven't been particularly cost effective that we're beginning to see emerge. The ability to burn multiple types of fuel in a single combustion engine. And so our engineering community has been working on that and to support what you've been doing with renewable fuels needs to continue to work on that. The car that shuts down, and you see it in some of the more expensive and in some of the Asian cars, say, when you pull up to a stoplight, not just the hybrids, but all of your vehicles will just shut down. And that starter motor then will have the ability to bring it back. In the 70s, I was a graduate student and in, in looking at things, and we used to sit there and watch, my wife thought I was nuts, I think, um, at a stoplight and watch how long cars idled. But little things about how you manage traffic how you manage the flow of traffic, why you're allowed to make a right-hand turn on red came out of fuel efficiencies. How do we do all of these things so that we aren't wasting fuels? And then I look at some of the other interesting things that have emerged. You know, most college campuses were, were built around the fact that people didn't have a car when they went to school. So you could get to all the things. You could get to your classes. You could get to your, the student unions. You could get to the places where you bought food by walking. Or maybe if you really wanted to be fancy, you could ride a bike. That's not as quite true today as campuses have expanded and we've become more and more dependent upon the automobile. But we know how to create lifestyles around an area where you don't have, aren't dependent upon getting in a car to do every single thing. And we need to think about that in terms of the efficiency. And then the alternative fuels. The biofuel pump is shown in the picture there. Or I can walk next door to your display and where you have a whole range of, of alcohol-based fuels plus gasoline and diesel. We really need, in my view, to continue and in the view of our advisory board to continue pressing 
the ability to not focus on one single fuel. We believe it's going to depend upon a lot where you live in this country, not just in the accessibility. So the East Coast may be very different from the Midwest. The Southwest may be very different from the Northwest. And so as we look at the, the automobile and the transportation systems of the future, we need to figure out how do we build choices into people? How do we allow them to pick what's going to be the best for their economy and locality? So it's sort of the reverse of what I described earlier that we did in the Department of Defense, where we looked at JP8 as a solution to everything. We need to flip that. Now, I will tell you the military still has a little bit of a different problem because we have to figure out how to get that fuel anywhere in the world, not just at the local pump. So we're going to work independently of, of those restrictions. But you may have seen uh, the Secretary of the Navy today, Secretary Mabus, has been working on a green fleet and how he can turn some of the Navy assets at sea into non-dependence upon just oil-based fuels. So we need to look at all of those alternatives as, as solutions to the problem, not one. As that's one of the ground rules as the chairman of it. I said, you know, we're a bunch of senior military folks, and we've got a lot of experience around the world in national security, but we really don't have a lot of experience in designing the systems that consume our fuel or the systems that develop that fuels. So we didn't pick an answer. We didn't say that you know, one fuel was going to be a better answer than the other, but we did recognize that there are alternatives out there, and all of them ought to get a chance to compete. Now, I know you can read this carefully, so uh, I would refer you to uh, the cna.org uh, website, and you can pull this chart out of our, out of our book. But what this is is a list of alternatives. And, and you might just look at the, the colors that are on it. Um, green is pretty good. Tan says eh, a little bit of problems, and blue says longer term. And at the bottom of each of those charts of different alternatives is our assessment of what it would take in terms of time to develop them as a, a real alternative. Biodiesel and ethanol fuels are there, and they have a lot of green on them. They aren't the only ones that have a lot of green on them, though. And so we really believe that we need to look at all the alternatives that are out there and provide them where they make sense in the best locations. So again, I don't expect you to, to study this as an eye chart while I'm looking at it, but I would tell you to go back and look at the report that we wrote, which is available on the web or by hard copy, and to understand that you're in, a, in a, an environment where there, people do have choices. The other piece that I would argue that we found, and, and while this chart does not depict it, is that we tend to look at these things singularly, that ethanol is a solution, or methanol is a solution, or biodiesel is a solution, or it's gasoline. And we tend to separate also our electric supply, which is basically coal and gas today, and we separate the other renewables, solar and wind. When we look at them together, you can start combining things. Because the, one of the problems with coal-fired power plants today is CO2. CO2 is a major ingredient of methanol. And so we can look at these things of how you produce these fuels and by not looking at them singularly, but how do we really leverage the whole capability. And that's where I think American creativity and innovation can pay off. The work that you've done here in renewable fuels and ethanol and biodiesel start setting some of the standards that we need to build on. But we need to keep building that and keep driving that to find better solutions. I've watched the Department of Energy, and they do a lot of good research work, but they haven't found the solutions because they're not economically driven. You are. And I think that's one of the other keys to this is to capitalize on the research but figure out the business end of the deal. And it's not going to be one solution, uh, but look at how do we combine a lot of these alternatives in providing us alternative output in all of the power sector. Uh, because one can bring down the other. Think about that. Telling people a story, I have a, a home that's based on a rural electric system, and um, power lines came down one day, and, and we were without power. That's no big deal, right? That happens all the time. Well, on the electric cooperative we have, we were without power for 10 days. Now, my wife was by herself at that time, and she wasn't really happy because, number one, it was summertime. So the temperature inside the house was well over 90 degrees every day. Number two, we depended upon water from our well. Without electricity, we couldn't pump any water, so she had no fresh water. And number three, um, she couldn't turn on the TV or the radio or the Internet 
which we had didn't have an internet at the time, uh, for power to find out what was going on and when the solutions would be fixed. So eventually we said, you know, this answer for us was to get a propane generator, as we used propane there, and that could last for probably about two weeks, running off 500 gallons of propane to power enough to keep our water running. That was sort of an eye-opener to us on, on different alternatives and how the pieces fit together. And if you went to a gas station, then they may have had fuel, but it was worthless because they couldn't pump it because their pumps were dependent upon electrical power. So all of those pieces, in my view, get tied together, and we all need to think about how we bring all of those factors together, not just one or the other. So you are sitting here in this room and, and taking a step. We are taking action, working together to find answers to these questions. The first thing we said is we need a strategic roadmap. Now, military planning, that's something that we do routinely. We develop a plan. There are strategic plans, operational plans, and tactical plans. And we put those on the shelf, and we bring them out periodically. And in cases today in Iraq and Afghanistan, they're doing them every day and updating them. But in those strategic plans that we develop, we have what we call branches and sequels. It means you aren't constrained to one thing. In our view of the world, the enemy gets a vote. In your view of the world, other economies get a vote. Other sources get a vote. And so as we look to this roadmap, we need to figure out what are those branches and sequels and how do we develop those alternatives for the future. But most importantly, we need to, to build that roadmap and stick to it. We've all been through the oil crises in the 70s. We've been through oil crises now, and we see our attention get very much focused on it. We've had hydrogen economies. We've had different solutions to the problems, but we don't stick to it. And so we need that strategic roadmap, which we set out, know that it's not the perfect answer, know that we're going to take deviations, but we stick to that roadmap of getting ourselves off of oil dependence. Second, we do need to reduce consumption. Now, overall, as an economy, we're going to increase consumption in all probability if the economy grows back to the, where we would all like it. But as individuals and collectively as organizations, we need to become better at managing our consumption, stop wasting a lot of the, the energy that's available to us. And we know that we've done that over time. We have become better. But as soon as the price of oil goes back down, we kind of slough off again. And so we need to stick to it. So we have to be able to reduce that consumption, develop that roadmap, and do those things in conjunction and stay with it. Promote alternatives. That's what you're doing here today. And I encourage you to keep doing it. And I encourage you to look at all the alternatives that you can on how that you develop those biodiesels, how to look for better efficiencies, how to look at ethanol, how to look at methanol as a partner as opposed to a competitor. Uh, Alcohol-based fuels provide all different alternatives, different solutions. We have an economy that's pretty much built the infrastructure around liquid fuels. So if we go to gaseous fuels, that gets expensive. How can we do these different things to provide ourselves the best solutions? But look at all the alternatives. Look how they fit together, not each of them individually. And I said the Department of Defense is the biggest single consumer of oil in the country, but it's a small part. So we do think that we should provide a leadership role and continue to work on those and provide the incentives, the grants that we give to universities, the work that we do on our engines to promote it. Every engine that's in the Department of Defense today has been run on biodiesel. We've looked at all the alternatives to make sure that they can. Ironically, you know, one of the biggest problems we have is that, that half the fuel that's consumed in Afghanistan today doesn't go to vehicles, goes to generator sets. They don't work very well on biodiesels. And so some of the things that we think about the big vehicles, uh, we also need to think about, in the case of the Department of Defense, how we look at a lot smaller engines that are out there consuming fuel. We bring all our own generator sets to provide ourselves power. So that's one area that we know that needs work. So bottom line out of this, it is a shared commitment. Um, it's shared with you, as well as those who are still in uniform, and it's shared with our federal governments, our local governments, and industry working together. We may have to pay now a little bit, and we are doing that in the economics of it today. But we should take that opportunity to improve our productivity, to look at the alternatives and develop them for the long range so that we can, don't have to pay later either the lives 
of our sons and daughters wearing the uniform or the quality of life for your sons and daughters who are living here in, in Iowa producing fuels, uh, producing agricultural products that are needed around this country and around the world. So we want to do this the right way, but the commitment, and I'm, I'm absolutely couldn't be more pleased to see a group like this come together to address the issues of how do we move forward. I think that's what we need to do more of. This is a World War II poster. There was one like this written for the ground forces and another one written for the naval forces. And the bottom line of both of them was stick to your job, oil is ammunition. It's your job to change that from oil is ammunition to alternative fuels are ammunition. We need that for our country, and we need that for our Department of Defense. Um, your military relies on fuel to do the job that we ask them to do. I don't care whether it's the infantryman to cook a meal or whether it's the aviator who's flying a high-performance jet. We all need fuel to do our jobs correctly. So we encourage you to, to change that poster for the 21st century to alternative fuels are our ammunition, not just oil. 